Welcome to our Q20 Forum series organized by Florida Today, Eastern Florida State College, and the League of Women Voters of the Space Coast. Today, you're going to meet the candidates running in two Brevard School Board districts. We're going to begin for the first part of today's forum with District 3. It covers South Brevard County, including parts of Palm Bay and Melbourne, as well as Indy Atlantic and Satellite Beach. The schools included in this district include Palm Bay High and Satellite High. I am Isadora Ringel. I am Florida Today's engagement editor, and I will be your host today. The, the two District 3 candidates running on the, 18, on the August 18th uh, primary election are incumbent Tina Deskovich and opponent Jennifer Jenkins. Welcome, ladies. Hi, thank you for having us. Thanks, Isadora. After we're done with Tina and Jennifer, we're going to meet the candidates running in District 4. But that's for the last part of the forum. And before we move on to our opening statements, I would like to introduce our rules. Each candidate would have one minute to answer my questions. They also get a 30 second rebuttal if their opponent brings them up. And again, just a reminder that this race will show up on the August 18th primary and it's an unpartisan race. So that means essentially that voters of all affiliations can participate. So let's begin ladies with your opening statement. Uh, Tina, if you would like to go first, you have one minute. Sure, thank you. Hi, I'm Tina Deskovich. I'm your current school board representative for District 3. It is an honor to serve in the community that I was raised in and that we're currently raising our children in. I've kept my campaign promises since my election in 2016. Together with teachers and support staff throughout the district, we've made remarkable gains over the last four years. We've moved from a B to an A district. For the first time in nine years, we have no D and no F schools. Our graduation rate is up over over 2% and over 40% of our graduates are uh, graduated this year with also a vocational certification. I'm the best candidate in this race because right now more than ever experience matters. We have a very complex $1 billion budget we have to oversee. We have 70,000 70,000 students that um, we are trying to get a quality education for during this time and 9,000 employees that we're trying to uh, carry through this most turbulent time. My 20 years private sector, my four years already serving on the board uh, makes you. me really qualified to continue in this position. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, my name is Jennifer Jenkins, and of course I am running for school board district three. I am deeply invested in public education, both professionally and personally. Both myself and my husband are teachers with Brevard Public Schools. We have an amazing four-year-old little girl who will begin BPK this school year. I decided to run for school board because I believe some of those who are currently serving make decisions based off of political agenda and not what is best for our community. It is time we have a representative who is truly representative. As your school board member, I will manage our teacher shortage crisis. I will create a pathway for our students to access 21st century jobs right here on the Space Coast. And most importantly, now than ever, I will ensure our students and our staff return to school buildings with a clear workable plan with safety at the forefront. Thank you. So let's move on to our first question, which is obviously, I'm sure you're not surprised, it's about the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, reopening schools. Uh, and in my following questions, we're gonna dig into what the, the school board is actually doing, but I wanna begin with a very basic question. Of course, as you might, everybody might know by, by now, Florida's Commissioner of Education has mandated schools to reopen unless health officials say it's not safe. But my question is, uh, without looking at the mandate from the state, do you think it is a good idea to reopen schools this fall. Jennifer, you're going first. You have one minute. So excuse me for being blunt, uh, but our school board members made decisions to send our students and our staff back to school buildings in virtual meetings where they felt it wasn't safe to have the public present. My husband sees 150 students a day and the only precautions he has in place is a block schedule while reducing him to 90 students a day and a gallon jug of hand sanitizer and a plastic face shield and unrealistic expectations to space out 30 deaths in a small classroom. I am concerned, not only as an educator, but the wife of an educator, the mother of a young daughter, and the daughter of someone who is immunocompromised, that I have to put my family at risk and my students at risk because our school board wasn't brave enough to stand up and say, this is not how, and this is not the time. Tina. 
Yes, ma'am. So as you know, we do have the mandate from the governor at this point, but we are watching um, the numbers and working with our local health, health officials very closely. Brevard is not Miami-Dade. Brevard is not Broward County. Uh, our numbers are above that 5% rate, but they are not that high above the 5% rate. And the opening of schools, we pushed forward to the 24th of August. That gives us time to watch if these numbers decline or watch if these numbers increase. We are being very cautious and we are doing everything we can within our power to protect our teachers and students. Our staff is working 15 hour days right now to rearrange schedules, to reduce the contact so that um, students are in more cohorts, just like all the uh, medical experts have asked us to do. Uh, we are supplying hand sanitizer. We are creating um, deep, te deep teams, uh, cleaning crews to go in and, and sanitize our schools. We are doing everything that the experts have asked us to do in order to make it so safe for our students and our teachers to return. Thank you. And, and Tina, as you mentioned, the school board uh, decided to set uh, August 24th as the first day of in-person classes. Um, but the board uh, also uh, expressed some concerns in its latest meetings about uh, the lack of metrics on, on reopening schools and then you know, maybe shutting them down again. The board will now discuss setting benchmarks for safely reopening schools. And my question is, should the board consider delaying the start of in-person classes or even not reopening, depending on what those metrics show? Um, and Tina, you're going first. I think the board needs to consider everything right now when we're looking at the safety and security of our community. Um, we haven't had our meeting yet on which metrics we are going to adopt to use. Unfortunately, it's being left to school boards to pick those metrics uh, because there's so much disagreement within the medical community. We have uh, the spreadsheet we're going to work from. Some school districts have already set metrics like Miami-Dade. They want a positivity rate um, at 10% and then trending down to five. Our last few days of positivity rates, um, starting at like the 24th, we've been at 6.3, 5.9, 5.1 on the 25th, 5.5 on the 26th. So we actually are right in where Miami-Dade would want to be to open, but maybe that's not the best fit for Brevard. And that's what we're gonna discuss as a district, um, as your district school board tomorrow to make those decisions. Jennifer? I think it's crazy that we are now discussing metrics to base whether or not we're going to send our students back to class after we've already approved a reopening plan. I believe it's also alarming that during our school meeting, uh, school board meeting when we were discussing the reopening plan that there was members of the district and the school board that uh, openly talked about how the health department here is saying that they weren't the ones to make the decision to go back to school and no one had pressed on that issue. I think it is the responsibility of our school board to have decided what metrics are safe before they even discuss this reopening plan. I think it is first and foremost, uh, most important for our students and staff to know that their school board is clear about what they will accept and not accept. And I think it's important to mention that there has been some news out there that we already have had positive cases at some of our schools and even at our graduation. So it doesn't leave me with a lot of confidence that our school board is ready to tackle this issue. Isadora, can I respond to that? Because first of all, um, our health department has declared publicly at our meeting that they were not the ones that were gonna that had the permission to approve. It has to be approved by the state. So it is being left to school districts, and that is why we have moved forward with having an exact meeting just on settling the metrics of what we are gonna choose because medical experts have not told us what those metrics are. And and second, to put forward a plan. Uh, is, is that's called leadership. Like we have to have a plan in place because we have to open schools at some point. We can postpone that plan if needed, but a plan needs to be in place of what we're gonna do when we're gonna open. And so I don't think that shows any problem at all. You have a school district that scrambled, got together, put a solid plan in place. If we have to move that date as needed, uh, you Thank know, you. everything is, is, is in flux. We have to follow the policy and Thank make decisions day by day. We'll move on. And actually, you brought up the plan that was released by Brevard Public Schools. Uh, by the way, that plan is available online for viewers if you want to go and find it. Um, I want to ask you, the question is, how comfortable are you with the plan released uh, and what would you change about it? And for example, the plan calls for fewer classes during the day and unnecessary furniture to be removed from classrooms to create more space for social distancing. Uh, but for example, class sizes are expected to remain the same. Uh, please give us your thoughts on what the specifics of the plans, things that you like, things that you do not like. 
And uh, Tina, I believe you're going first this time. Okay, thanks, Isadora. Uh, that plan, uh, so many hours of work have been put into that plan, and there's some great things about that plan. My biggest concern, and I've said this um, over and over again, is the amount of children in each class. Uh, we have to get those numbers down so students can be six feet apart. Um, when we look at that, the cost of that and the ability um, we don't have the space, the classrooms to pull it in. So, you know, I think it's going to be on the board to really work with our community and our parents to understand the role that they're playing um, with the options that they have in hopes that they will keep their children home the first nine weeks to make that decision so that the children that need that face-to-face -face education can go to school and can be six feet apart. Jennifer. My issue with the plan is that there is little in place for the safety of our teachers and staff, and quite frankly, in my opinion, even for our students. I feel like the school board is relying on our parents to keep students home in order to reduce class size, when in all honesty, that is something that they had control over over the past years that they were in office. And personally, I think that we should be starting off virtually, and we should have taken at least the first nine weeks to assess what's going on in our community, prepared our students and our staff to slowly transition back into the school building, just like our communities have done when we started out in phase one, we, we slowly uh, transitioned back into phase two and three. And we should have thought outside of the box. One of the ideas that I had was to offer in-person brick and mortar to our students that are in the lowest 25% of our performance and our students with disabilities and IEPs who really need that structure and that face-to-face -face interaction, thus giving them smaller class sizes and that interaction that they really need. Isadora, if I can respond to that, I think it's important that all parents, all parents have options. And that's what we've done. We've given every parent. You can't say that somebody's issues are more important or less important because they're at a Title I school or they're in the, the lowest percentile of learning gains. We don't know everybody's individual situations. We don't know every health concern of a child, but a parent knows that. And a parent needs to make the best decision right now for their children. And our plan has given them four options to do that. They can be, be brick and mortar. They can keep them home. We've made it so flexible that they can transition back and forth. If mom thinks it's- yeah. You're good. The, the, That's a great of my time. Thank you. We're still, we're, there's plenty to talk about COVID-19. Just have a couple, few more questions about that. But I wanna talk about masks, which is uh, something that people are very divided over. Um, the school board will revisit the possibility of mandating masks for students and staff under the current plan. Face coverings are, quote, expected when social distancing is not feasible. The question is, do you believe uh, the school board should leave the policy as it is, or do you believe it should mandate masks and under what circumstances? And Jennifer, you're going first. I absolutely believe that our school board should be mandating masks. This is for the safety of our students and for our staff and ultimately our community. Brevard County has 550,000 residents and our school system is almost one fifth of that population. If we're gonna throw all those people into this possible contagion, um, we're gonna do some damage to our economy here in Brevard County. I know that my opponent is gonna say it's difficult for our little ones to wear them, but I think we can be reasonable and use common sense and mandate it for our students that are of a particular age and also have exceptions for our students and our staff that have medical needs that might make it difficult for them to wear those masks. Tina on the topic of masks. Thank you, Isadora. So the word that we voted on uh, so far as the board up until now is 5-0 is expected. And we have gone forth with that, with that expectation. Dr. Mullins put out a video saying all students need to arrive with a mask. And that has left some flexibility because you, as you look at these numbers of who is getting COVID, who is spreading COVID, uh, ages four and under, it's practically zero. And so, you know, mandating a mask on a four-year-old is going to be more challenging and brings in more germs from every research study that I've read. Um, I think we need to have um, a, different, a different category of students. There is a big difference between a 17-year-old and a four-year-old. And so um, that's one of the things we're meeting about tomorrow. So this question is a little early. We're taking, you know, hundreds of public comments tomorrow on this issue. We're going to hear, I know, already from a mother and her daughter who's deaf. I mean, there's a lot of people that fit into this, this scenario in this box. And I think we need to be safe. I think we need to expect our students and our staff will have on masks, but I think there has to be exceptions. 
may I may I say something to that, please? Okay, go ahead. Thirty seconds. Yeah. So my opponent mentions is that tomorrow that we're going to have some public comments on this. We had three hours, one hundred thirty public comments on this topic, and the majority of them were asking for our schools to open safely and to mandate masks. No one is asking a four year old to wear a mask. I work with them on a regular basis. I understand how difficult that will be, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't put it on any of our students and our staff, and we shouldn't protect them. A mask mandate is a mask mandate for our four-year-olds. So I believe by you saying that you no, want to, no, that you can absolutely write the policy however you would like to. Okay, let's 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 Tina. Do you want to go? I'll, I'll give you thirty seconds to to say something. Well, the word mandate is the word mandate, and she said she wanted a mandate for all students, and then she just said nobody is asking for four-year-olds to wear a mask because that that contradicts each other. All right, so um, still on the topic of COVID-19. Um, as you know, Florida Today just reported this a couple of days ago, uh, almost 300 uh, Bayside High graduates have been asked to quarantine after uh, an attendee at a commencement ceremony tested positive for COVID-19. How should schools deal with cases among its students and staff once uh, in-person classes uh, start? And should the board be open to closing brick and mortar schools again if outbreaks happen or if the trend in cases and deaths uh, goes up again? Uh, Tina, you're going first, one minute. Uh, yes, ma'am. This uh, it actually has already been worked out with our local health officials. There are processes in place for, for every scenario. And we are bringing on this week, um, an employee that will be uh, a certified nurse from the health department, but working in our building to help make the calls on the on the situations that are a little more confusing. So she's laid out in our meeting several scenarios that could happen. And of course our brick and mortars could be closed again. We have to be willing to do what it takes to keep people safe. Um, if a student is diagnosed in a classroom, that classroom will be closed a minimum of three days, two days it has to sit, and one day it has to be thoroughly cleaned. Um, and then we have to trace where that student has been throughout the school, which is why we're putting procedures in place to keep them in cohorts, to keep them um, moving around the school a whole lot less than they have in previous, uh, you know, in previous school years. Jennifer. I am concerned about the fact that, again, over almost 30 hours of meetings, we just go around and around about these possible variables and scenarios that'll take place if a student is uh, diagnosed or it becomes positive or if their family member is positive or if the teacher is positive. I feel like there is just so many questions up in the air that really aren't concrete and answered. And what concerns me, again, as an educator is that as a staff member, I'm going to get 10 days of paid leave through the Coronavirus Family Safety Act. And I will have to use my own paid sick leave if I am forced to quarantine again. And there is no plan in place from the, dis from the district uh, to address this concern. Isadora, there is a plan in place. Uh, some of this is um, negotiations right now between the district and with the teachers union. So it's a little inappropriate for a, school a sitting school board member to weigh in because we have to sit in kind of a quasi judicial role. But, you know, I've watched the meetings, I'm following the discussions, and it's 10 days coming from the COVID re Corona Relief Act that'll come to anybody that is symptomatic. And then on top of that, you get 10 days of um, workman's comp. So you could have 20 full days paid. The district Thank is not going to, to cover the difference there um, just for coming up symptomatic. Thank Jennifer, it looks like you have something to say. I'll give you 30 seconds and then we'll Absolutely. move um, The okay. fact that our employees are going to have to file workman's comp is absolutely ridiculous. They're going to have to prove that they con contracted that virus at school and good luck doing that. Anything else you want to say, Tina, before we move on? It's just that uh, 20 days paid leave if you are symptomatic uh, seems to be what you know what all the medical experts say is needed um, if something goes beyond that then that's going to be an issue for bft and the district to continue to debate and discuss thank you uh well let's move on a little it's still kind of on the topic of covid 19 but not quite uh, and the question is how do you plan to ensure an equal quality of education for all students knowing that these past months of some revo of, of remote learning left some students be because of inadequate technical equipment or and or support we also know that depending on their age, some students uh, thrive and others don't uh, with uh, distance learning. Uh, if you can address that question, uh, Jennifer, you're going first. 
Yeah. So, you know, as an educator, I understand how difficult the transition to emergency remote learning was. I work with students that are in our exceptional student education program. So I understand more than than ever how difficult that is. Um, and that is something that I'm really concerned about. And that's why I brought up, you know, let's think outside of the box. We really should be focusing the majority of that CARES Act money that we're getting on closing those learning gaps of our students that are going to show the most uh, reduction in their learning gains. And statistically, that's going to be our students that are typically performing in the lowest 25%, as well as our students that have IEPs or are working um, as students with disabilities. Tina. That's one of the reasons, Isadora, that brick and mortar schools have to be open. We have students in pockets of this community that haven't seen a book uh, since the spring. We have uh, students in our community that don't speak English in their home and haven't heard a word of English since the spring. We have got to get some of these students back in school as soon as we can safely. In our CARES Act funding, uh, we have allocated funds uh, specifically for MIMS Elementary, Endeavor Elementary, our lowest performing schools or most underserved schools, to not only get an extra hour of school um, um, if, if that works out, but to also put two extra support um, personnel in there to help get, uh, close in the gaps of, for some of these students because they are, they are really struggling in those areas. We've allocated $2.5 million more for technology. We have families, some families that checked out a computer from us that have six kids at home and we need a few more uh, computers in their home if they choose the e-learning or the virtual option. So um, we are working diligently to identify those students and to bring services to them or to get them into the school safely so we can serve them. Thank you. And I want to ask you just uh, how how happy or how comfortable are you with the, the with the virtual options that are being offered? As we know, they they're different than what was offered in the spring. Uh, there's uh, the board approved extended e learning options for students. Are you comfortable with those options? Would you do anything differently, Jennifer? I think it's great that our parents have a choice and our students have the choice to do e-learning so that they are still registered at their home school and they can easily transition back into that school. The one thing that I have um, an issue with is our, our teachers and our students in the secondary level. They are going to be required to teach both in-person classes at the same time as, as students are watching them live at home. Uh, it's a lot of work, a lot of planning, a lot of managing, and I don't know how effective that is gonna be for both our teachers and for our students. Tina. Yeah, see, I mean, we're, we're creating the wheel. We're in the middle of a pandemic and we're doing the absolute best we can to bring choices to our families. And uh, you know, these e-learning options are gonna de-densify our schools. And that's a number one concern of mine, as I've already said in this debate. The secondary option, uh, the more students that stay home and learn, the, the smaller that class size is going to be. And I, I think that's you know priority number one, uh, right after educating these students is keeping these class sizes small. And so there's risks, um, there's benefits, right? There's good things and there's bad things about both sides. But these are the creative out of the box ideas that my opponent just you know brought up that we need to come up with creative ideas. And they're not perfect ideas, but um, our staff has done a good job putting together solutions so that we, parents and families have options during this time. May I say something to that point? Yeah, 30 seconds, go ahead. Yeah, so our school board likes to uh, use the new word de-densifying de uh, our classrooms. And what's frustrating about that as an educator is, number one, our e-learning classrooms are going to be held to the same class size uh, amendment mandate. Um, so it doesn't mean that we can have more students on e-learning versus in the classroom. And the other problem is, is there are certain points in the school year where we have to reassess the numbers of students that are in the school building. And there is a potential that we won't be funded the same way to have the same amount of staff, thus making our know, class size is just as large. We move on. We'll move on to the next question. And, and this is a question is more of a political question for both of you. Uh, as I said in the beginning of the forum, school board elections are nonpartisan, but the District 3 race has taken a partisan flavor. They recently reported that the local Republican Party is openly supporting Tina and the local Democratic Party is supporting Jennifer. Tina, you told the audience at a recent Republican hobnob that the balance of power on the five-member school board could shift away from conservative Republican if Jennifer is elected. Uh, my question to both of you is, has this race become too partisan, and is that good for the school board? Tina. Um, you know, politics are one thing. Running in a political race is one thing, and how you govern is another. And I have proven over the last four years 
that I am open, that I am honest, that I will meet with anyone that believes anything. And I will take the time to listen to them and process it, discuss it with my board. Uh, I am not, I do not govern in a partisan fashion. So I, I think that that's what people should look at and that's what they should consider when they vote. Thank you. Jennifer. Political organizations have the right to endorse whoever they want to, but I believe as a candidate in a nonpartisan race, it is your responsibility to drive the nonpartisan conversation. My opponent started making partisan comments when she was concerned about the strength of my campaign, and she made a grave misassumption. The strength of my campaign was not because of the recent support of a political organization. It was because of the year-long support of parents, teachers, and community leaders diverse in political affiliation that are tired of not having their voice be heard. So my opponent can continue to pay for robocalls that claim she has kept socialism out of the schools, but I'm gonna to continue to point to the poor policy choices that she has made and, and show people why an educator gave up a year of her life to run for this office. Tina, 30 seconds. To rebut or is that closing, I'm sorry. If you wanna rebut, I assume you would, but if, if you don't want to. <laughs> Isadora, you know, I think again, I, you know, I, I made it clear of how I've governed. I've, sh I've proven to the public in Brevard County that I am open and that I listen to everyone. I have sat down with organizations that are uh, supporting my opponent this time around. I have listened to them. We have made great decisions as a board in unity, Democrats, Republicans, independents. We work so well together. And I think it's important during this time that we continue, that we have the opportunity to continue to lead together. Thank you. And actually, we're approaching the end of this forum. It went by so fast. Um, and uh, if the voters haven't noticed the differences between Tina and Jennifer, this is your time, candidates, to uh, explain, you know, why voters should choose you and not uh, not your your candidate. And you're going first. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to Florida Today, Eastern Florida State College, and the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum today. I hope that I have proven that my experience in the classroom is what would drive my decisions on the school board. I hope that you trust that I will prioritize our teacher shortage crisis, that I will ensure all of our students have equal access to education across Brevard County, and that I will do everything in my power to keep our students and our staff safe. Again, I am Jennifer Jenkins, and I look forward to serving on the school board, and I am asking for your vote on August 18th. Thank you. Tina. Thanks, Isadora. Um, thank you all for hosting this uh, this forum. It's been a good opportunity for Ms. Jenkins and I to, to discuss some of the issues that, that are out there and facing our community. Again, I have... Um, it's been an honor to serve our community. I'm invested in our community. I um, have served on so many boards in our community, and I raised five children with my husband in this community. And we have done great things over the past four years. We are moving in a great direction when it comes to student achievement. We are digging down into our underserved students. We are digging into the numbers of our, of our black and brown students, and they're seeing gains like they haven't seen uh, before in Brevard County. And those those are priorities for us, and we're going to continue with that. First and foremost, as I said in my opening, experience matters right now. Four years on the board, I have learned so much about our budget. I have learned so much about state laws, local laws, our policies, and I believe that during this time, we need to, I need to use that experience to continue to leave Brevard through this unprecedented time. Thank you, Kenneth. I wish we had more time to talk about issues, but I... I Really appreciate you being here with me. Again, Tina and Jennifer will be on the August 18th ballot in District 3. Make sure you vote. Go to votebrevard.gov uh, for more information on voting and where your voting uh, locations are. Again, thank you, candidates, for being with me. Thanks, Isadora. And thanks for having me. Uh, now we're back again. Uh, right now, we're going to meet the two candidates running for Brevard District 4. It covers Central Brevard, including Country, Vieira, and Rockledge. The schools included in District 4, in District 4 include Rockledge High and Vieira High. Uh, there are two candidates on the August 18th ballot. They are the incumbent, Matt Susan, and his opponent, Dave Worrell. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us and welcome. Thank you, Isadora. Good to be here. Thank you.
So let's begin with your opening statements. Again, you have one minute to answer my questions and do your opening statement there. And you also get a 30 second rebuttal if your opponent uh, brings you up or brings up your record. So uh, if you could start, Matt, that would be great. You have one minute. Sure. Thank you so much, Isidore, for giving me the opportunity in the Florida today and the, and the voters in District 4 for serving you with distinction for the last four years. In that four years, I've had the opportunity to work with inside my community groups. Um, I, I, when I work on the school board, I focus on community partnership and building from within. And during that period of time, we've been able to create the largest jobs program in the state of Florida that is now being replicated throughout the state of Florida. And then nationally, we were recognized for having the model that's moving forward. We were also able to create jobs or programs, welding up an astronaut, manufacturing at Bayside High School, aviation over at Ogale High School, and a host of other construction programs and expansions in the trades. We also were able to cut $27 million of, re of reoccurring money and to resend it into the teacher in the classrooms. We also cut $113 million in debt. Basically across the board, we were able to, during the COVID crisis, I was selected as one of five school board members in the state to lead the school board association for all of the COVID return for school boards to issue what would be the memorandum. And during that time, I, I focused on having the only mobile feed sites inside of our, inside my system to feed the kids in O'Galley. Right. Let's move on to you, Dave. You have one minute. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Dave Wills and I'm a university professor. I've been in academia on a full-time basis for 25 years. I've been tenured and promoted at two different schools. I've also worked um, uh, overseas, specifically in the United Arab Emirates, where in my last position, I was an associate dean. I bring um, what I believe is a, a different skill set to this job. And I kind of like to clarify up front, I'm not running against Matt per se. I don't know that he has or has not done a wonderful job, but I think at this point in time, we need someone in our school board that brings a different skill set. And I do that. More specifically, I have extensive online, uh, at a distance, blended learning capabilities and knowledge that I think at this point would be very helpful. In addition to that, I've been in several different leadership roles as uh, uh, faculty president and faculty speaker and a number of committees where I've demonstrated the ability to work in groups to uh, identify and resolve any number of problems as they have popped up. And Thank just you. lastly, I like the songs that I was once. Let's move on to the first question. I know we're, I'm just going to ask both candidates to respect our time limits. We're trying to be flexible, just but just out of yep. fairness, make sure we cover all of, all questions. So, uh, my question obviously is about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and reopening schools. Uh, um, as you know, the Florida's Commissioner of Education has mandated schools to reopen unless health officials say it's not safe. And we will be discussing the the details of the the current plan that the board has. Uh, is moving forward with, but I would like to know if, if you believe it is a good idea to open schools, brick and mortar schools in the fall, and Dave, you go first. No, <clears throat> I think it is a big mistake. It's as big a mistake as it was to open the state. This is not July, 2019. This is July, 2020. We are in the midst of a global pandemic that is killing people. And even the numbers that you hear, relatively low percentages still relate to people that are dying. I believe there are better ways to get our kids re-engaged in their academic programs that don't bring them into contact in mass in our schools. Now, I don't believe that there aren't opportunities that can be used for those at-risk students and students that have issues where they can't use a laptop, don't have access to the internet, but bringing our kids back into school doesn't just endanger them, it endangers faculty, staff, administrators, food service people, bus drivers, custodians, and then they come home. We can't do that. It's on reopening schools. Uh, thank you. As it was mentioned before, the uh, governor's mandated that we open in brick and mortar. And what I would like to do is, is there's some factors that I think that some of the people um, that are out there are not taking into consideration right now. Uh, women in the workforce, they just reported the largest jobs decrease or, or increase in unemployment in our nation's history since the Great Recession. The teachers, the women in the workforce have actually lost 
twice as many jobs as they gained since the Great Recession. And that's in due to the fact that a lot of our women are the caregivers for their children. Um, I was just yesterday, I was inside at a mobile home park yesterday, spending time with some of my families and they were begging me to take the kids back. They said, I cannot educate my children online. I cannot do this. And plus I can't file, I can't have a job that is, that is routine and, and secure because of it. You also have one of the largest knowledge gaps ever in the history of this country. And at a time when we don't have money for Title I families to, to get online and to do it, they don't have the online option that is available to many of the other families because they don't have somebody to sit home. So you have a knowledge Thank gap. You. And also one last thing, is it all, there's online predators that are, okay. that are taking advantage of our children. So let's, thank you. Let's move on. And you brought up something about children not being able to educate their uh, parents, not being able to educate their children at home, which leads me to my next question, which is uh, how do you plan to ensure an equal quality of education for all students, knowing that these past months of remote learning left some students behind because of inadequate technical equipment and support? And Dave, you're going first. There's a bit of a transition that we have to go through from the traditional face-to-face -face brick and mortar school to a more um, online at a distance environment. It's not gonna be easy to do that, but I know it can be done. I know what a quality online program is. And I know what makes a quality online program and I know what doesn't. Uh, the kids we have today, you had to get an iPad and in a second, they're swiping away and finding what they need to do. So I think we're not giving our children the credit due that they can pick up on this. I don't doubt one bit that it's gonna be a bit painful for some folks, but we need to keep in mind that it isn't 2019, it's 2020, people are dying. And I think it's totally irresponsible that our governor has mandated that our schools be reopened when our state is the epicenter worldwide for this pandemic. How can you do that? Matt? So one of the issues that comes up is, is um, handing an iPad to individuals so that they can learn and go as they, as they can um, is one of the difficult things. He brought up a great point. So if we are online um, learning is gonna be based upon a student taking an iPad and learning themselves, that's very difficult. The model that we have for online at home um, where they're tied into the schools and e-learning is gonna be based upon a classroom teacher working with them and a parent that has to be assisting them along the way. That's the only successful way to do that. And in some of our Title I areas, which is where my heart goes out to, that is one of the hardest things is we have a huge knowledge gap that is occurring inside there to say that my families, that when you walk into a trailer park, um, whether it's the Meadows or somewhere else in the O'Galley corridor, and you see some of the homes that don't have electricity running to them, and you say, here's, a, here's an iPad, we have severe issues that we need to give those students the option to come to school and in brick and mortar. And that's what the biggest problem with this online is. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, also, I'm sorry, Dave. May I make a comment to that? It's not a rebuttal, just a, a comment to what Matt just said about- um, Okay, the, I'll, give you, I'll give you 20 seconds for that one. Okay, no problem. I agree, Matt. And that is where the government, that's where the state and the federal government needs to get involved to help us fund those people that don't have electricity, that don't have that capability. And if it means we have to educate our parents, let's do that. But we can't put our, our the well-being and welfare of our, of our populace in danger by reopening schools. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, anything else? I gave him a rebuttal and wasn't really a rebuttal. Do you want to, do you want to take 20 No, minutes? I mean, we, we, we have a knowledge gap that's expanding to say that the government can come in and run electrical wires and put doors on houses and do all that stuff and, and feed every one of these kids. It's the other issue because I ran out of time. These kids are starving. There's a lot of the kids that are inside my O'Galley corridor that we created a mobile feed site for. And if you look at my population of underserved inside the O'Galley corridor, only a small percentage of them were actually able to take advantage of that. So there's a lot of other issues that are there. Okay, so uh, still on the topic of COVID-19, but I wanna move on to masks. Um, the school board will revisit the possibility of mandating masks for students and staff. Under the current plan, face coverings are, quote, expected when social distancing is not feasible. Do you believe the school board should leave the policy as it is, or do you believe it should mandate masks and under what circumstances? And Matt, you're going first. Yeah, no problem. I said last week that if the um, current status of what we have for masks is not gonna be good enough, I wanted to have a debate tomorrow over whether we were to move towards that or not. 
some of the issues that I have is, is that we need to protect our people. We need to protect our staff. We need to protect our students. We need to protect our bus drivers, our administrators, our everybody that's out there. And to say that we're going to not mandate masks because it, it makes a health concern. So we need to have a clear debate about that tomorrow and see where that lies. One of the issues that gets brought up is, is that you have a lot of the under, you have the kindergarten, pre-K and those kind of kids that are inside there. That causes for concern. So last week when we were talking about it, I said, I was the one that asked, I said, I have no problem mandating masks, but I want a plan coming forward. I want to sit down and find out what we're going to do with some of those kids and what the plan is, because just sitting there and saying you're going to mandate masks is not a good plan, but coming forward with a good one. And there's a lot of great models that I'd love to talk about um, that I'll unroll tomorrow. Thank, Thank you. you. Dave? Uh, why do you need to plan mandate mask? It's probably the simplest, most effective thing we can do at this point in time. But I, you know, I'm thinking of a, of a classroom with, uh, with some young kids, you know, second, third grade, running around with mask on and they're keeping their mask on. Why are we going to subject those guys and gals, those little guys and gals, to a, uh, to a classroom? We should not be back in the schools at this point in time. If we're requiring masks to protect them, why put them in there and endanger them to begin with? to include all the other people that they will be subjected to. So mask, mandate mask, absolutely. Thank you. And um, the school, the Brevard Public Schools has released a quite comprehensive plan and it's online for those who are curious and want to read it. Uh, but I would like to know if you've read the, the plan and um, how comfortable are you with it? So, so, and what would you change about that plan? For example, the plan calls for fewer classes during the day and unnecessary furniture to be moved from classrooms to create more space for social distancing. But class sizes are expected to remain the same. Obviously, if your parents send their kids to brick and mortar schools, that might be different. But I want to know your thoughts about this plan and whether you would change anything. Matt, you're going first. Yeah, no problem. I, um, I I truly believe that every one of our teachers that wants one should receive an M95 mask. Um, I also believe that any teacher that wants to get dividers, we have CARES Act, the money that we can do, um, they should be able to request any kind of dividers for their classroom to create the small group instruction. I'll tell you, as a former educator, one of the worst things that you can do on a block schedule is put a kids in a 90 minute block with no, uh, no group schedule, no moving around. So I would do that. I also have extreme concern over bringing, forcing, there was an issue that came forward with teachers and asking for leave over an entire year um, that are in high risk. I absolutely support some of our teachers that are in high risk right now that wanna take a day, a year off so that they could go get another job and come back at a better time. I also support the fact that we need to do something different with our workers' comp sitting down there. Um, telling our teachers and our staff that they're gonna be gone for a while and then come back and we have to, they have to not only justify getting workers' comp, but on top of that, they only get two thirds of their pay. Some of our people that are working inside of our schools, their pay Thank is the you. only thing that they have for their work, for their, for their, work, for their health Thank insurance. You. Dave? I think like any plan, it needs to be, um, you know, implemented and then monitored and then changed as quickly as possible. But once again, outside of you know, closing the schools and not opening them, uh, if we're going to implement that plan, it needs to be monitored and needs to be adjusted. I would recommend that we stagger the class uh, attendance to minimize to the greatest extent possible the number of kids that are in a classroom at a given time. I also think that we should again, use the online format, and in order to keep up and to not fall behind, that we look at teaching schools on uh, classes on Saturdays. Uh, now, this also comes into play with, uh, with the faculty and having to uh, deal with overload and things of that nature. But again, this is a global pandemic, and we can't, we can't ignore that, and we need to take the steps that are appropriate to make sure that we address the health and welfare of all of our people, all of our stakeholders. You know, I, again, these these small percentages are all well and fine, but how many deaths? Teachers. Uh, recent data indicates fewer students are enrolling in schools of education, and that uh, is creating a statewide teacher, teacher shortage. My question is, what can school boards do to recruit and retain teachers in Florida's classrooms? Matt, you're going first. Great. So about three and a half years ago, I, I, I drove out to Okaloosa County where we were sitting down and they're in a big battle with Santa Rosa over teachers and their plan that they have out there as far as attracting teachers with not only incentive based 
um, attractions, bringing up the minimum pay and everything else became a model that I tried to bring back to the, the Brevard schools. We also, not only that, but we created a system where we, we started a teacher academy at Bayside. And I personally, when I was a teacher, started the, the teacher academy at Space Coast. Having students that are within inside of our school district become teachers is one. Attracting some of the ones inside the state by regularly visiting some of our colleges is another. And a lot of the parents that make the car loops that we go through every day, those parents have teacher certifications and they were stay-at-home moms. We need to go after them too. There's a multifaceted way of going and attracting teachers, but there's one thing that is common. If they're not getting paid enough, if they're not being respected enough, then they don't want to come to the schools and work. And that is something that we have been working on for the last four years. And I can be proud Thank of you. that too. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, good points, Matt. And uh, I, I would take the same approach that, uh, that I would recommend for uh, STEM. Uh, we need to take advantage of where we are. We're on the space coast. We launch rockets, we go into space, we go to the moon and back. Look at what Elon Musk has been able to accomplish. I think we need to get our industry partners re-engaged with the education system. You know, I came into education at, at, almost as a lark, but once I got into it, I couldn't believe what kind of career it is and what a quality of life and how rewarding being an instructor is. I think we need to make sure that the people that have been successful uh, uh, are, are brought back to the classroom and that our, our instructors, our faculty are used as role models. There is, this is a, a, an incredible career. I, um, I, I, I will be teaching a class face-to-face uh, -face at FIT in August. I can't wait to get back into the classroom. It's is it, can I follow up, can I follow up for 30 seconds? All right, I'll give you 30 seconds. Thank but you, because I didn't ask for it before, but I just want to let um, everybody know that Northrop Grumman has donated over $100,000 and is one of our huge industry partners. Boeing has multiple events and works inside of our schools. Every one of our industry partners is already interconnected into our school system. We made that as number one four years ago. They have every Friday, we have multiple um, Northrop Grumman engineers that work inside of our schools. And every one of our industry partners, I promise you, if you ask, if you say a name, I can tell you a program that they're doing inside of our, our schools. And I'm very proud, but you're right. We launched yeah. Rocket. We need Thank to make you. everybody. Thursday, I, I gave you 30 seconds. Would you like yep. to yep. say anything else or just out of fairness, I thought I would offer you the yep. same 30 seconds. Of my turn? I'm saying if you would like 30 seconds, because I gave him 30 seconds to continue. Well, if you if oh, you don't. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I um, my uh, my grandson was in a science program uh, at McNair and then yeah, at McNair and then at Merritt Island, and uh, they frequently called upon the industry to come and judge those science projects, and that was fantastic. Uh, sometime in the past, I was involved with um, um, I forget what it was called, where you know professionals would come and they would work with kids on business projects. Uh, things of that nature. We just need as much of that as possible. And we're really missing out if we don't do much so more. The next topic here. And the next topic is mental health. Uh, as you know, concerns about mental health at schools that have also obviously grown since recent shootings, including the one in Parkland. School boards in 2018 received money from the legislature to increase mental health uh, counseling at schools. Uh, my question to you candidates is, uh, was that enough and what else should the school board do regarding mental health? Uh, I believe I kind of lost track, but I think Dave is going first in answering this question. You have one minute. Well, that's a great question. This is something that's, uh, I think it's playing our country in a large way, particularly as it relates to, you know, to guns and who should and should not have weapons. I, um, I don't know if we're going to be able to afford to have, you know, psychiatrists on staff full time, but we certainly need to be aware and, um, and, and have some identifiers for at risk students so that we can intervene at, at an early point in time to determine what kind of um, what kind of help they may need to get them through. Uh, I think in, in our in our world today, we've got a lot of single parents at home. Uh, I think Matt talked about this earlier, where people need to get back to work to support themselves. I think that's led to a situation where our kids, um, uh, you know, come to school with some issues and we need to be able to identify that as quickly as possible so we can address it from the school standpoint as much. And there's something else missing here. And I, and I think that is getting our parents much more. Time is up. Matt. 
Thank you. And I and I agree with you 100 percent, David. There's some great points there. One of the issues that we also that gets left behind is, is that every time we think of mental health, we only think about social workers. And just so you know, we went out and expanded and offered up 17 positions. And because of the workforce, we were only able to bring nine in. And that needs to be reevaluated. I truly believe in the next year we need to look at targeted positions for raises. We do that now, but if there's a severe need inside the community, we need to have stipends that will increase the cost for the or the pay for those teachers. But that's only one part. See, the other part is, is that having a student find a place inside that school that bonds them to that school and so that they can open up with that school. And when I was a teacher, we had multiple clubs and we had multiple opportunities for the kids to take advantage of some of the stuff in school, because some of these kids hard life at home is not very good. And the only sanctity that they have as individuals is that school and having an outlet beyond just a social worker to be there. We have teachers every day that are social workers to 30 to 150 students, and they love every one of them. We need to have opportunities for those kids inside the schools too. Thank you. Um, still on the topic of mental health, uh, are schoolyard and cyberbullying on your radar? And what actions do you think the school board should take to reduce these behaviors or to address them? And uh, Matt, you're going first. Absolutely. I think that the cyberbullying is the next thing that's beyond the bullying that David and I dealt with when we were in school. But here's another issue that's even more strong than that is the online predators that we have that are trying to take advantage of our students right now because they've been out and they've been on social media for a long time. We had a program that we were getting ready to release that taught parents on how to to watch and monitor their social media and TikTok and everything else that is out there because there's a lot of these predators that are sitting there and they're targeting our kids right now. And that beyond, so there's two pieces to the social media. There's the fact that our parents need to be monitoring their kids' stuff And then there's also the fact that the online um, bullying that goes on inside the schools, we dealt with multiple expulsions this year that dealt with exactly that, holding these kids accountable to this online bullying and and doing a a very strong and good job of doing it. Thank you, Dave, on on bullying and cyberbullying. Yeah, I agree uh, pretty much with, with Matt. And I think it's another matter of how well we educate all of the stakeholders here, you know, our kids and also the parents as to, you know, what they're doing, not only just, you know, when they're bullying face to face in the schoolyard, but also the cyber thing. Cause you know, when you, when you get online, you're, you're even separated more. And I think the opportunities to bully in that environment have, have gotten to a shocking level. Um, good parenting, I think is a, a major part of that. Uh, my son, uh, my youngest son is, is 11. And uh, he's not online today because he's screwed up <laughs> and he won't be back on until tomorrow. And I use I, I use the computer as kind of a tool to get him to do other stuff. But I, I talk to him frequently. My wife talks to him frequently. You know, who are you online with? Who are you? Who, who you're playing Minecraft with? Who? Who are, do you know that individual or you're doing Fortnite or whatever? OK, what's that guy's name? Uh, where does he live? How old is he? And I ask my son those questions and uh, we're, we're relatively vigilant. All right, gentlemen, uh, this is it. Uh, we're about to wrap up. I'm going to give you uh, 30 seconds to wrap up and give us your closing statements just because we need to we need to finish the show. Uh, Matt, if 30 seconds to make your final case for voters. Thank you so much. I just want to say that we are about uh, this, 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 the final part of my campaign to go for another four years is is to just say that I've done what I've done and now I'm going to move forward and continue to do the expansion of trades, protect our teachers and do the other pieces. But if I can just send a message to everybody, our teachers are about to enter into one of the most tough situations that our education has ever seen. And all of our first responders have been amazing, but now we are becoming first responders. Our staff needs to be protected. And we as a community need to come together to protect our teachers, protect our staff, protect our bus drivers, and support us in this, in this gallant effort. We'll move um, on. Okay. Sorry, we got to wrap up. Uh, sorry about that, Dave. 30 seconds. If you can stay within 30 seconds, I appreciate it. Nice job, Matt. Talking to the bell. Through the bell. Sorry. Uh, I, you know, I, like I said earlier, you know, I'm not running against Matt. I'm running for this position. I bring a different skill set as a university professor, as an aviation aeronautical um, uh, um, professional, worked at the Space Center for years, worked in the private industry, and then also as a, a lastly as an educator and an administrator in education as well. I come from the faculty. I know what it's like to be in the classroom. 
Uh, I know what it's like not to have all the tools that you need. I know what it's Thank like you. to have tools in the class. So we can, I can wrap up. Uh, Candidates, thank you for joining us again, Matt and thank Dave. Thank you, Isadora. August thank you, Dave. Thank you once again. Make sure you vote in the primary elections.